Hello, everyone, and welcome to another K6 Office Hours. Yay! Mm -hmm. and as always, I'm Nicole van der Hooven, and today I have... Leandro Melendez, here <laughs> reporting from Mexico City. Happy to be back, Nicole. Yes, it's it's been a while. Um, we kicked Paul off today. Supposedly he's on a break, but he's actually going to still be listening. I don't know, go figure. <laughs> but we tried to give him a break at the very least. <laughs> Leandro, would you like to go through any announcements? Where are you going to be? Okay, yeah. To start off, uh, there's going to be this cool event in a couple of weeks called Nerdearla. Let me bring uh, some info about it. You can uh, look at it, uh, Nerdearla, uh, nerdear.la. <laughs> um, it's a, an IT in general, not only testing conference, where we have been invited. I will be giving a talk about modern performance, how to integrate all these things. And uh, we'll be in person over there uh, in Argentina, uh, where I will be, well, yeah, mostly speaking in Spanish, but uh, something cool for everyone. I'm going to be bringing my monster uh, streaming tree. So I'm going to, if everything goes well, awesome. I'm be running around the event, showing everyone uh, how things are happening. Look, uh, don't miss it. And if you can register, I think there's some virtual attendance that you can do. And Grafana is an adamantium sponsor. So we will have also lots of uh, content from Grafana. The Latam Amigos um, will be having a booth and we will be doing some noise. And let's see what fun can we have over there. It's going to be really, really fun. That's awesome. Next time, maybe next year, I want to go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that will be awesome. Argentina, <laughs> you will like it. Oh, hola, Jose, ¿cómo estás? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I think that's that's the only thing that's happening soon. I'm bummed that I can't be there, but I'm I'm glad that you're going to be there, and that we're, Grafana and K6 are going to have a presence there. So today we wanted to talk about workload modeling because that's actually one of the things that I wish we got more questions about. I feel like we get a lot of questions about like how 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 many thousands of users do you need or how long do you need to run a test, you know? But um, there's there are more things that you can do in workload modeling beyond those standard ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh... I would say out of the universe of performance, a sub-universe is just workloads, modeling, and trying to figure out what to test. Because in, in performance in general, what I see often is that everyone wants to try to bring down the system, slam it, uh, capacity testing. And many times, we don't need that. We, need, we have different situations. It's very um, contextual. What is the problem that you're trying to solve with your performance tests? And depending on that problem, the, the, what are you going to model in your workload is going to be vastly different, even if it's the same system that you are testing. One situation can cause a problem. Another situation can cause another. All of them are different workloads. And you can have the standard one, like, hey, I want to check how, am I, how is my system going to do in a day in production. So it's, it's a huge and interesting topic. Hola, Carlos. Charlie dice, te esperamos en Argentina, Nicole. Gracias. Ah. <laughs> Quizás el próximo año. Uh, Constantinos also says, hi, everyone. Oh, we've got a, we're, we're growing a, like a Spanish-speaking community. This is really awesome. Yay. This is the push bueno. for like, yeah, for an <laughs> office hours in Spanish. Um, sorry to, to interrupt, but no, yes, no. I think this is actually my, I don't think I've told you, but it's my favorite part of the load testing process. I find this part so exciting when you don't know like what shape the load is going to be in or, or like what you need to test. This is the part that I like the best, talking to people and figuring all that stuff out and coming up with something that I think is really representative of the test that you want to run. But I think 
I guess let's start with the usual things that people think about. Like when we think about test parameters, there's definitely the number of virtual users or, or threads as they're sometimes called. There's the duration, both the duration of the entire test, like, but also the steady state and ramp up, ramp down periods. And then there's throughput like the number of requests per second, sometimes that's a requirement. So I think that those are the things that people think of when they're looking to ramp up a load test, but it, that might not be what you need. I mean, ramping up is only one, one type of load test, uh, one type of way to test your system, right? I know, Leandro, you're, you have this rant about the difference between performance and load testing. Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many mixes and difference. I mean, I already opened up with uh, uh, that point that you don't always need the exactly the same performance test. I, in part, I kind of like it. And uh, at the same time, I know frustrates me and I frustrate people that when they always ask me, like, what is the performance test that I have to do? Yeah, and the answer is always it depends. It's um, highly variable, as you very well say. Sometimes it's not just about the ramp up. Sometimes you just really want to slam the system, like throw a few hundreds or even thousands of users at once, no ramp up. Some others you need long um, wait times. Another rant that I have lately is this difference that you very well mentioned: virtual users or threads, instances, whatever you want to call it. Because many of us also are used to thinking of users, which was um, the simulation of real people. But nowadays, with uh, these modern applications, service and microservice spread all over the place, it's very different from what we used to have in the monolith, where a user kept a session there. But now we have, um, what is it called? S uh, stateless? Uh, yeah. Where, where it doesn't matter if you're talking to a server in, I don't know, Timbuktu, I don't know why the place came to mind, but and the next of your steps you're going to be doing in an AWS in Europe, and you could be spread all over the place, and you are not that single user anymore. You are, I, I like to give this example of a, if anyone has gone to the US Cheesecake Factory, this restaurant with a huge menu, when you go and do a, multi uh, time meal, like uh, for a soup, then you get this. And to get to the other side, you have to go through the previous steps. But nowadays, it's like a food court. You can just go to the burger place and get a burger or go straight to the dessert and ask for it in another store. And it's very different, the type of loads and how you, would you simulate it. You don't have to do go first to this and to this. You can go straight to others. And that's how applications work nowadays. That also adds an, a lot of uh, interesting types of tests that you can do performance and load-wise. Yeah, it's kind of like when Netflix reports their number of users that that have watched a particular show. Like I think the latest one, the latest big one was the Squid Game, right? What we need to keep in mind, for example, is that for them, a viewer isn't necessarily one that watches the whole thing. I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's something like someone that watches a minute or something of a 45-minute episode. That is counted as a viewer. So mm -hmm. if you're only talking in terms of viewers or users, you're not you're missing a whole bunch of nuance between different types of users a user that's constantly refreshing um or or is, is streaming it all throughout for an hour is going to be is going to have a different effect on on the system than one who just like clicks in watches a bit and then leaves right so th that's why it's a little bit ambiguous to just rely on users. The shape really matters as well. But Jose says here, um, load tests are just part of performance testing. Very well said. But yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my rants are taking effect over the world. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I also, I agree with that. And I also think that sometimes it maybe it's useful to th also think of load testing as a way to approach performance testing because there are different approaches for, for testing for performance. Load is one of them, but 
because if you start to think of it as a technique, then it's a technique that can be applied to other types of testing. Like, for example, scalability testing. Usually that's more put towards the reliability end of the spectrum rather than the performance side. But load tests can be used to see how scalable your application is, right? Because you need to know how your application behaves, if it can scale out or up or even down if, if you'd like. Yeah, those are so, some, some of the different uh, tests, as you very well said. Uh, it just jumped at me the scale down, like the ramp down. That's uh, many are, as you said, obsessed with the ramp up. There are some others like, how long does it take for the container to be decommissioned? Uh, how uh, before it was like, uh, how long is the ramp still being used? Is it still being allocated? And some of these things are important, are part of this reaction, this response time, which is not always like, when do I get a response? But when there's a reaction, there's something that we're expecting. And the wrap down is very much and very important part of it for performance and for load. And I was also thinking that another type of performance test that isn't a load test could be like static testing. For example, one of the things that one of the reasons that I've been looking into Kubernetes a lot as a tester is because I think the way that it is declarative and all of the the configuration is held in a manifest file i think that's so useful for a tester because there's you can look at a manifest file and if you know what to look for like are there resource limits which is not something that i did when i was first deploying you know my first application on kubernetes that's not something i did now as a tester that is part of performance testing. Like if I'm testing an application on Kubernetes, I'm going through the manifest files to see how it's set up because maybe there are issues that I can find that are to do with performance that are that I, I would find without even running a script at all. Yeah, all this universe of performance tests that also may not fall into load, as you very well say, are... Uh, I don't know how to call them because it's not relevant only to load. You are checking yeah. for the performance response and tuning. This what you mentioned is falls a little bit more under tuning, where you want to make sure you have the best configuration, the best mix, either for uh, Kubernetes to come up as fast as possible, to be as efficient as possible, to be the commission. How are you gonna expand if you need, like horizontally, vertically? All those matters are critical that you can add up into your performance test stack to call it in a way and are critical and it's not again as we, we keep throwing examples it's not just push everything to the to its limits because as well in the cloud it's going to be possible that you won't find out limits you will depending on how you configure it you may just be increasing your cloud bill <laughs> and not find any true limitations but at the same time, that may be your uh, 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 attempt, the risk that you're seeing. Am I going to survive uh, Black Friday where even as I throw as many resources as I can to my solution, is it going to be enough? What else do I have to do? So at some times, you still have to do this. Um, and I apologize. I call them the BALT, Big Ass Low Test, where those are humongous. <laughs> And you have to still do them, not as much as we used to, but you still have to try to push the system at times when that is your concern. But nowadays with the cloud continues and that the changes, we're already in production, we already know the performance. There are some other performance tests that we need to do, as you mentioned, Nico, uh, the, the synthetics as an example. We create a K6 script that is triggered, uh, let's say from K6 cloud every 30 minutes, we don't need to kick the system. Five users, 10 users, run it for 10 seconds, one minute, and continuously know the performance of our system in production or pre-prod. If we don't want to trigger uh, a, a PR or a check-in of code to trigger the script, just let it running. It keeps checking, oh, something happened at 3 p.m. Oh, it's because, I don't know, Leandro checked in code and uh, it messed up everything and now the response times are all over the place. Some of these things are not, I mean, five users count as a load test, but I call them the mini load test, right? 
Yeah, sometimes that's what you want, though, right? But let's talk about what could happen if, let's say, you you have a test that you and workload modeling maybe was skipped, or someone didn't do it right, and it is executed. What could happen in production if if that's all that you go on and it's never addressed? So there are. Um... I got on several times, sadly, too many, um, more than what I, what I would like to be, where first you come with totally random requests for a load test. Like, why do you want like 5,000 users? You know the answer is because it's a cool number, but they give you explanations and they don't have even like, what do you need think time or sleep time in between steps? Or no, 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 they just want to slam the system throw it out and many organizations think that that's a, a the utilization the workload that they have they only know yeah 5000 users that's what i have wait 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 are those registered users on your system active users are them concurrent users that you usually have in there and they have no idea they just know that there are 5000 something in the system i give this example uh, with a gym a gym membership how many people have the gym membership? Could be 5,000. How many people often go to the gym? Could be 1,000. How many people do you have at a peak hour inside of the gym? Could be 100, 400. So these differences, many do not know, have no idea. And to go with, sorry? I was going to say, I, I like that example of the gym because I think that's one of the mistakes people make is that when you think, I don't know, I'm just going to choose a round number. Let's say that there's 10,000 people that go to a gym within a year. And if you were going to, or let's say 12,000 to make it a, a little bit better to for calculation. Um, and you could say, okay, well, that means it's a thousand a month, right? So then you, you can split it up that way. And maybe you'll be tempted to run a test for like signups or, or something like that at a rate of, a, uh, with the users, the number of users of a thousand in a month trying to get that. But we're, that's not taking into account the shape of that load, that how it's distributed over the entire year. I would bet that the number of people that are joining gyms is higher in January, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know. Maybe it's like 6,000 of the 12 are actually in January. That matters. The seasonality matters. Like, when do people do taxes? usually the last possible minute, you know, so it's it's also the time frame that you're looking at. Recognize the seasonalities of your application and the use of your application. Yeah, that that seasonality comes not only, as you very well said, you ha may have a number of 12,000 users in the gym per year, but maybe six of those happened in January only. And, and the same for tax season. You may say, yeah, we had like uh, a million users uh, during the year. Yeah, but 9.5 million were just on the tax uh, deadline. And it would be really wrong to spread them all over a big test and do your math based on just that single item. I had several requests to do low tests simulating a day. And I'm like, why do you care about what happens at lunchtime in your system? Probably you care more what happens at 9 a.m. when you have the rush of all the employees logging in and the system starting to work. You got to be also like mindful of what you're trying to do and what type of uh, activity you need to simulate. What is the risk from it? Is your risk moment at 9 a.m. when everyone comes and logs in? Or is it at 5 p.m. when even as everyone's leaving and closing, you have a small spike? But there are bad jobs happening at the same time. So lots of circumstances fall into how you may want to model this uh, workload, departing from what you're trying to accomplish with your load test, with your performance test. And I think, Nicole, that's why you say it's so interesting and so entertaining, because you have it's the human side, machine side, uh, behavior. Yeah. You become an economist, like trying to figure out all these factors uh, around your system, right? 
Hussain said, but you'll be asked how many people can the gym hold per day while being comfortable as how many requests can your system or endpoint take while being under 200 milliseconds? What's the SLA essentially? Yeah, it's, it's, it totally depends on, on what exactly you're measuring. Are you talking about how many people the gym can hold or how many they can hold comfortably? Or do you just care how many people swipe through, you know, that check in still or, or what, whatever still? Um, it is, or is it how many people are taking showers? Like, which part is it actually? What percentage of people who go to the gym take showers afterwards? And does that change on the weekends versus, you know, during the week? Those all are going to change the kind of test you run. So that's why it's so important to be clear on why you're testing. And and to to your question, Jose, that's a very good one. I, I remember some gyms where you had to go and do this class, right? Like the um, fight class or the Zumba class and all these things, which you have to do from beginning to end. And you have a limited space on, on those classrooms, right? And that reminds me a lot of the monolith days where it's kind of easier. It's kind of more straightforward to say, yeah, I mean, elbow to elbow Zumba class, I need to spread my arms. It's like, uh, two meter wide that I need, and it's kind of uh, easier and straightforward to do the calculation. Is this like a, a finished sauna session where people will be packed elbow to elbow? Your numbers are going to be very different. And as you say, Nicole, if uh, this gym is more like, let's say, for basketball players, well, height is going to be another uh, thing that you have to think about. <laughs> or Dutch people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And or. or <laughs> If it's a gym in Japan for sumo wrestlers, you also will have to have a different that set of matters. Uh, of matters that it's going to change. And to go with, the again, the, the old monolith in a uh, classroom to an open gym where each machine that you can do exercise on is like a microservice or a service. You can just go straight there, stress it. And your measurement will be not based on the users. It's like based on how many services do you have that can concurrently service users. And then it's interesting because your focus narrows a little bit, not from the whole gym, but okay, the bench press machine. It's it's only a buffy guy that can be doing bench presses there at a time. And I have that limitation for that service. They have to queue in line or they may go to other and you have to model from that. And that's where also some of these analyses comes very useful. What is the workload or throughput that that machine gets? I don't care that much about the others. If I get this one well, I can do the same with each one of them and do a general analysis. And that's where I think like it gets difficult to say like this number of people. I know that is a question that we get often. Personally, when I give the answer, answer is like, yeah, you can still call it people, but it's more based on the machine. No, no, I need a number. Okay, here's your number, but it's probably, <laughs> and and it's not useful. If you ask me, it's not that useful at a hundred percent other than to give it to sales or projections or something like that. Arturo says, also you might need to know which classes will be more demanded to find out bottlenecks. Yeah, different. It's it's kind of like like classes could be like transactions, you know, different user flows or different features. Yeah. Um, I know one example that comes to mind is I was working for a, a gambling company. I was specifically working on a horse race and all of the load that we, we have to prepare and to, we have to simulate from different sources just because of this horse race. And the funny thing is that there was another product that is not related. There's like a real life horse race, but also there was this product that was like a simulated horse race. They're like 3D animated, you know, and you would think that because there is a real horse race that maybe demand for it would go down. It didn't, it went up because people were out and they're having a beer at the pub with their mates and and like they maybe didn't really know whether they were real horses or not that they were betting on i this is what i love about workload modeling it matters what people are doing psychologically and it usually doesn't make sense like why would load for that increase why would you have to prepare for that that's not it's not an obvious thing, right? But it really just depends on the situation. 
That's that's where I was saying uh, it goes a little bit into the field of behavioral economics, where yes, you have to take into account uh, all these human being reactions uh, into your load test. There's another one that I like to include at times that when we have good monitoring or good statistics of uh, what are the workloads that the system generally will get, we get this, uh, I call it rage clicking. Like um, we always have uh, experiences like at the first click, the system didn't react. Yeah. There's even a meme that uh, said like, congratulations, after you gave a thousand clicks, the finally system reacts. <laughs> And, and it's we will we'll do it. It's like, oh, come on. And like, we are not thinking like those extra clicks are going to send more requests, more messages. And hopefully we prepare the system to not receive them again. But most of the time, they happily get more requests. And they get queued up and the things may get worse. More people will jump in. And as more people are in, are, most of them are also angry, rage clicking, uh, the, the thing, let's say, trying to buy a ticket. That's why you get some of those because like, whoa, whatever you do, don't click again on this. Let the spinning wheel, it's going to take its time. And some of those fixes are not only in the IT area, how you have to measure for them, but it's like leave a long sleep time on your script, on your workload, how are you are scripting it? Because there's going to be that spinning wheel that tells them, don't do anything. Please don't close the window. That's yeah. Painful. It's it's so entertaining. It's uh, really fun, I have to say. Yeah, or like the, the refreshing thing, like maybe at the end of the month or something when people are expecting their pay, then a lot of people are logging into banking apps, just refreshing and just waiting for that pay to, to hit their bank accounts, right? Um, I know that happens with, with betting as well, right after a race, the amount of traffic kicks up after, well, just before the race ends and then after, because people are like, did I win, did I win, did I win? <laughs> you know, and if you're only focused on the first part, on the betting part, and you're not focused on like the, the end of that, um, then you you may miss some customers. Uh, you may get a lot of negative publicity because you know you you didn't pay out fast enough or or something like that. Um, but let, can we talk about like what are these? I kind of think of being a performance tester as having all of these dials that you can that you can mess with because as much as you want to plan. Sometimes you're not really sure how a system behaves. Sometimes with your first test, you're like, oh, that's what actually happens. Well, then let's turn this other dial, you know? So what are the things that we can change outside of the typical um, test parameters that we were talking about at the top of the show? Well, we, we have in, in our script, in the steps that we use to simulate uh, the user or the throughput, um, and in the scenario, and in the ways that we execute the scenario. We can execute it often, we can execute it only once and be done. Long scenarios, we have several, but um, I'm just going to deviate a moment because I thought on some that was very sure. important that we didn't mention. If you don't model well your load test and you tell the company, hey, you are going to need the servers this side, these many containers or this... Um, if you pushed the test wrongly too far, you may be asking to buy resources, spend too much for what you really mm. need. There's the like other false reason. negatives. Yeah, you, you can like, go too far and have unused hardware resources. Like yeah. uh, I bought like a billion gigs of RAM, and I'm only using eight. You, you, it's it's also like an opportunity cost, or you're wasting money. You have to have a very good tuning. You can fall short, you can shoot for the stars, and you shouldn't, at least on low tests. But um, with that note aside, um, yeah, we have pacing, we have throughputs, we have sleeps, we have weights, we have uh, ramp ups, we have durations for uh, tests, ramp downs, ways in, we, in which we do the test, because I am a little against this type of super complex scenarios. And I was requested for some of those. As I said, the company wanted to simulate the morning and the uh, lunchtime and like simulate like 
one process goes up uh, over this time and then goes down while the other goes a little and all these like mixes you have to narrow it down and trying to figure out what is happening there are some others where like yeah push it for a long period of time and see what happens uh, that's called the endurance test well one of those other factors is the duration of the test you can a known test that can go for days and I think my record is four days long uh, low test to see how resources would um, be consumed or refreshed. So there are so many factors that we can use. Even I would say that the type of data that you put in that will modify the workload of your application. If you are triggering a process that, as you were saying, yeah, just give me the video feed of the horses. Okay, that's one work, one type of workload. You ask the same one, but instead of the video feed, give me the simulation of the horse, like the animation or something that is heavier for you system. That's a heavier workload. So could be even the same process or even like uploading a document, sending an email. Could be a hello email, I'm good, or war and peace in an email, which I have seen people sending those type of things. There are... There are so many factors that you can put inside of an automation for performance tests that gets um, could be madness, but it's so entertaining. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I know you mentioned like think time and and pacing as well. That's so. Um, I I really like to to talk about that because I think it's so overlooked. I think. Sometimes people don't put think time at all, which is good if you're trying to get up the throughput and the load that you're trying to simulate is something with like massive load, right? But the problem with the think time is that if you don't have it, then you could run the risk of the load generator itself being a bottleneck because yeah. it's like trying to keep up with that constant pace. And if the utilization, the resource utilization, meaning like CPU and memory are too high, then it could actually invalidate the results of your test because if there's a bottleneck even from the load generator, then what's the, what's the point in using that bottlenecked load generator to test your system? Yeah, I mean, that, and that's a thorny topic, I would say, because uh, think times, the, the time, for anyone not familiar, a machine, our automations can go inhumanely fast. They, they can go at computer speed, which is not what we are trying to simulate a real, real person activity. We human beings have, as fast as we can be and try not to have it, our hand is moving from the mouse one to... We click enter, just those tiny little times add up to, we need to tell the script, wait a little bit here or there uh, to be able to simulate a human better or to generate a more realistic load. As you say, Nicole, the load generator may be overloaded because we, but you told me it was going to be able to run uh, 10,000 users or 40,000, I don't know which one's uh, the last one that we were using for K6. Yeah, but uh, that's also relative. If you are putting each one of these thousand users to, I don't know, uh, uh, as you were saying, download uh, uh, Squid Games in 4K in Netflix, maybe you won't be able to handle that much. So there are so many factors that you have to take into account when you are designing this workload. With uh, pacing, that's another one that is, um, I would say, not not well understood because I, I remember it, I had to explain several times like, hey, you have this block of time that you want to generate load. How many times do you need this to be repeated? Okay. How long each one of those need to take? Okay. Get some time in between them so that you can fill up the space. And it's it's crazy how it falls almost into math. And you have to take into account, okay, each one of the steps I'm going to go back on the gym. Each one, you have to rest time between repetitions. You are in the gym like, yeah, one, two, okay. Uh, wait, da, 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 da. okay, again, one, two. <laughs> but sometimes you get tired, the weight is too heavy. You do that slower and probably your wait time in between has to decrease. You have to take all that into account. What happens when 10 guys are in the gym waiting for the weights to be released to use? And you have to wait for that 
I'm talking about longer response time in your applications when you have concurrency. You have to take that into account or get some help into automatically decrease. K6 has some uh, great options and functions for this. But remember, before I had to do all those calculations and try to run uh, mock-up tests or shake-up tests that would simulate this increased load so that I can have my times, uh, sleep or wait times and pacing times to get a correct workload just for that process when we had like 10, five, I don't know. So it was super entertaining and I don't know. I know, Leandra, you know um, my mentor, Stain Schapers, right? Mm -hmm. I think you've spoken with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so um, I remember that when I was first getting into load testing, he was the one that taught me what how to do it. And I remember looking through a test, the results of a test that I had run in Load Runner, actually. And um, I couldn't figure it out because the response time was like so spiky. It would go up to like five seconds and then it would go to almost nothing. And then and then it was so regular, like it was in several interval. It, it seemed like it was too regular and I couldn't figure out what was happening in the system. There were no batch jobs. I was like, what? why is this happening? And he's like, can I see your script? And he looked. I had a think time there for exactly the amount of time between the trough, the, the peaks. It was like, I, I don't know exactly, but it was like I had a five second think time. And he said, so what you're doing is because you didn't have a dynamic think time, there's like all of these thousand users are going and then stopping. And then one, two, three, four, five, go, tests. you know, Suddenly all yes, them are exactly. It wasn't and, and, the system at all. It was me. It was my flawed script. And that's another one that we have to be careful when we are uh, putting this type of uh, workload or think time, sleep time inside of our scripts. We need to kind of randomize it on top of everything that we are trying to figure out, OK, I want to do more or less a 1,000 hits per hour in this. I don't know how many users, but this is more or less what I have to do. So here's this factor that you need to randomize a little bit. Otherwise, it will happen what you're saying, Nicole. And on, on performance testing, based on experience, it beat me as well. I had that issue several times that I'm like, why is this? I have a ramp up. I have everything. Why suddenly I have these spikes? And when you have programmatically, a computer will be very good to do that exactly in the seconds that you tell it. And eventually, things will align, and you will have these spikes because they will, which to be honest, can happen in production, in real life with humans, but not consistently. You may see those spikes. You have standard deviations to understand them, and percentiles, and ways to analyze. But you want it to be somewhat random, to be kind of even a eh, spike here and there, or, or, or a valley, because that's also uh, natural for all of us performance and load testers to see those in a load test. But it's it's part of the sleep and wait time. It has to be randomized because we humans are not machines and I will do that exactly in two seconds all the time. And even if we try, we cannot. And yeah. we have to strive for that and makes things more interesting modeling, right? Yeah. Another thing is um, it some, can sometimes matter where the load comes from. We might want to assume for simplicity that it's all coming from a web app, but what if some of those customers are actually calling in and lodging some applications over the phone? It's a different kind of traffic. It may be going to the same place. It may not be. Maybe there's some other internal system. Um, it's happened to me before where I've seen that a company thought to test like the public facing system, but then they underestimated how much of the traffic actually goes through their own customer support team. And they didn't load test the internal portal. And that's what fell over. That's important too, if you're trying, if, if that is something that, that your application or your system does, then it is important to, to talk to stakeholders. I always just talk to customer support now because like, I feel like people don't give them enough credit. They know so much stuff. And a lot of headache can be resolved by just going to them in the first place. This is also um, 
so based on some experiences, I think it's super important that you have some sort of observability, event tracing, or at least count of uh, events on your system. When you're in production, when you are about to launch into production, well, it's just like Hail Mary, hopefully I got the numbers right. Uh, you have no idea, you don't know what is gonna happen if the mobile device is gonna ping you 10 times uh, more than the web one. Or you just made me think of um, a, a, an experience I had where the caching of uh, everything in the system was set up to be uh, at specific intervals. And it drove us nuts because when that caching expired, suddenly the system will get slow forever. <laughs> we were like, what is happening? And it's something that, it's a workload that um, had to be modeled or thought of and digging and understanding what is happening with this? Why, why is this getting so slow? Or on the other side, when you were saying we have a mobile application and a web application, but the web application was in uh, Angular and it was configured to load everything so that the users could work on them offline and would be less pings. In, in, in all, the attempt was good. They were trying to improve the performance. But that first slam that you had every morning when the users would log in and bring everything to your Angular application. And not only that, they had like so many widgets in the homepage and all of them were pulling so much that the system was going down and they were like, we need a spike test. We cannot get all the users. <laughs> we were like, but your user seems to be doing fine. I see the traffic and uh, it's only at 9 a.m. that you have a it's incredible spike that it was uh, at times bringing down the system. And you're like, those things, if we wouldn't have gone and it's not all scripting, it's not everything, just open your networking um, developer tools on your browser networking and see what is happening. We, we, we saw like, hey, why is it getting like a five megabit download from the initial load? Oh, it's the data for the user. Oh, okay. And on top of that, you're querying it. It's going to the database. How many people at the same time are getting those five megabytes? Oh, well, like a thousand. There you go. I mean, you're even like filling up the network card for the server that is storing that. And it's it super entertaining, I have to say. So we have a, a question here from Eli Bariki John. How how to, to do modeling, how to model a workload for API load testing with think time? That's interesting because I would say, okay, your API, what's up with it? Is it uh, separated on a microservice on its own? What are the dependencies that it has? That, I mean, uh, for a load test, does any other components affect it? And what are the requests that you get? Uh, the, do you get like many per second? How long does it take usually for the API to respond? Because that's another one someone told me like, yeah, with one single user, I can just let it go as fast as possible and I will get a thousand requests uh, answered. Yeah, but is your API getting parallel requests? What is, what is happening inside of your API? And that changes a lot. If you have to put sleep time in between each one of the steps uh, for your API, which if it's just an API, maybe pacing by, by then, right? <laughs> um, I would encourage him to think a little bit bigger, like big yeah. picture, not just API load testing. There's there's no specific workload that you know always applies for API versus always applying for end to end. It it really matters what kind of application you're testing and why. You know, so maybe start with a why. Is there a production incident that you're trying to replicate? Well, in that case, it's a matter of getting those historical metrics from you know previous incidents and seeing what exactly went wrong and what did the transactions look like at the time that brought it out. Then you need to model your your test to specifically simulate that situation. Right. But if it's like a completely new feature, a new application, you have no historical metrics, you know, where do you start? Maybe look at other other um, applications that are similar, if not like maybe maybe a new a feature is new, but maybe there's another feature that's similar enough, like that maybe they touch the same components or, or something like that. 
Um, it really depends. I, I think I would, I would go through basically like a checklist um, and try to try to determine like the the number oh, everything that's the the ones that we said at the at the start like number of users and ramp up and duration and throughput and um think time but then also things like where's the load coming from um not just not just which channels like telephone versus web app but also devices is it mobile versus web or geographic location sydney versus frankfurt you know try to dig in more to the kinds of people that are using your application and how they're using it in in performance testing and testing in general you do it because you are trying to mitigate a risk most of the time uh avoid it to happen or as you very well said like uh, diagnose it uh, if it's already happening and i think step back the first step what is the risk that you're trying to detect or mitigate or uh, or fix because that 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 departure point will give you a lot of insight as nicole says ah yeah the risk is that when all the mobile devices are turned on for my api that it will survive or it's just a new API that I'm going to insert in my continuous pipeline. That's a totally different story. And the approach, the think times, the workload is going to be very different depending on what is the risk that you're trying to mitigate. All the designs for the type of tests that you can do, I always give this recommendation. Don't try to test everything or a silver bullet for performance. It's uh, every time that you're doing performance testing, you're looking for a needle, like what is my bottleneck? Where is it? Where can it come from? If you try to shoot too wide or generic, you may be looking for that needle in multiple hay haystacks. Try to make your life easier and efficient on what you're trying to achieve with that low test. Um, that may give you a lot of indications uh, as at a departure point. And then when you're ready to drill down, I think I would start with the transactions, like what are the features you want to hit or user flows, and then separate them out. So don't assume that, for example, if it's an e-commerce system, you know, maybe there's one, one use flow, one user case where um, someone is just browsing and never really buys anything. And then there's another flow where people actually do go all the way to add to the cart and then put in their information and then pay for a product. So I would, I would look at, I would try to separate those use user journeys or like paths through the system and try to replicate those and i think i think what you said leandro about it being risk based i think that's a very that's very good advice too because you know if you're if you're testing something that has legal ramifications maybe you should be more thorough and conservative but if it's not a legal requirement and it's you know something that uh, doesn't have as much as much of an impact as that then maybe you can afford to take less fewer of those use flows because in the end you probably won't have time to do everything and maybe you shouldn't even try for that but it should definitely depend on your your situation your needs yeah the, yeah the highly context sensitive uh just to uh, uh, with the example of the food court your API may be one of the little uh, shops in the food court that sells, I don't know, donuts or burgers or coffee. And what is your API doing? What is the test? Are you about to open the store? Is the store already there and you are in a new product? Is it that you want to see what happens in rush hour just with your store? In the back end, are all the stores connected and they get sodas from the same uh, supplier? All those things, what is your risk? What is your concern? that makes you test for the performance of uh, your little uh, restaurant, uh, fast food or uh, API in your case, it will be vastly different. Do you want the people to have a think time to get in the queue one after each other? You have multiple queues, you have multiple cashiers in your little store. All that you have to take into account based on what you are trying to get out of your test. That's, I think, the departure point for all the workloads. So I also want to show this actual script. 
And um, this is a Kasich script that has three different scenarios, protocol, browser, and chaos. And the reason that I want to show this is that each of these scenarios has a very different purpose. That's why we've been talking about why, finding out your test objectives. For example, in the protocol scenario, this could just be a bun, this could be your API load test, right? And maybe this one you can afford, you would want to have like a thousand users. These are just, you can change any of these. So maybe you can have 15 minute ramp up and then, you know, like a 30 minute steady state or, or something like that. Um, and you, you can maybe have larger amounts of users here. But when you're looking at the browser test, for example, that's no longer just sent on the protocol level and it is very resource intensive. So maybe for the number of virtual users, you know, maybe 10 is enough. If, if you're running it concurrently with protocol level scripts, then maybe this is a good case to say that it's, it's just 10 users and you could have stages as well. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe you could just run it for 60 minutes if it's just 10 users. And then another one which is chaos, which is even more destructive, right? Because in this case, this one was terminating a Kubernetes pod. And so that's not something that you want to treat as if it were like this. You probably don't want a thousand users terminating Kubernetes pods, right? So in this case, you would be pay more attention to the start time and the iterations, the number of iterations, which I didn't even set for the previous ones might matter here more for chaos because you want to make sure it only happens once. And maybe you don't want it to start at the beginning because maybe you want it to happen during this steady state, right? So then maybe you could say, oops, maybe you could say 50 minutes so that it will be right after it's already reached the target load or, or whatever it is. So I, I think it's a good practice to, to separate out your scenarios like this, oops, and um, and try to and try to go that way. And each one of these can have a different executor as well. Um, in in K six, that's kind of what we refer to. That's what we use to to talk about the load profile. So a ramping VU's executor starts starts from it goes by stages in this case. Um, it starts from zero and then goes all the way up to a thousand. And then you can set each stage after that. Um, but something like the constant VUs is just from the beginning of the test, it's just 10 users are, are going to be started. And then for chaos, I use the one where I can set iterations because for that particular use case, that mattered more. But the thing is, all of these can technically be referred to as a load test depending on the settings, right? So one load test is not the same as the other necessarily. Yeah, I think, and, and you got me, uh, um, the, the key for performance testing, I would say, and workload modeling is because we're looking for the answer to what happens to my system when and that when is where your modeling and your workload will come from. As you were saying, Nico, uh, again with the API example in my, if I, my fast food uh, restaurant in the food court, what happens when I get 10 people ordering at the cashier? What happens when on top of that, I get an Uber Eats uh, order that it has to be sent to the browser out there? What happens when suddenly the lights are off in the food court and I get chaos? What happened when on top, and you can go as complex as you want and assemble a workload for all those situations, but it depends. Why are you interested in that peculiar scenario? Is it a risk uh, that uh, you may encounter? And what happens when aliens invade uh, Earth and, and my restaurant? Well, uh, that, that's not realistic. I don't probably, it's cool to think of it, but uh, I don't think you'll be selling more burgers, right? So it depends, and you have to always be like, what happens when that when is will, will define your workload completely what you're trying to find not just i just want to performance test it for what sorry while we're talking about when and timing could you maybe talk us through your rendezvous blog post 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very particular when situation in low test that applies. It's not that common, but sometimes you have to do these type of tests. So I give the example of a um, when you go to a ski resort, you have a lift and uh, or think of an amusement park when the attraction stops. A number of people are allowed into the attraction, the same with the lift in the uh, ski park. A number of people suddenly get into that, like the gates open for a little bit and you're allowed in. This happens on some systems. This happens from human behavior. There are some times when you will want uh, out of your pool of users to suddenly a bunch of them to go in. Why is this relevant? Probably because like in the amusement park and the ski resort, you have to do some previous steps before you get into the queue and get ready to get into the attraction or get, uh, ride the lift. You have to buy your tickets. You have to get your skis on, your boots, your snow gear. And the same in performance tests. You probably have to get your login, initialize cookies, get your credentials, grab some data that you need at that specific step. And this is something that came from... Um, I remember I first saw it in the load runner days. Uh, most of the automation tools had some um, version of this rendezvous. It's like a meeting point where everyone will wait until we get a signal. Okay, we can do this step for an important step. I tried to implement this in K6. I generated some code that allows you to do this on a timer. Like everyone will wait, 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 wait. Uh, second tree, second tree, second tree. Okay, let's go. There are a, There's another one when you have enough people in the queue. Okay, I have enough, you can go. I have enough, you can go. And there's a mix where you have enough or maybe don't have enough, but the timer already clicked, you can go. I don't know if you ha I have only three. I got to the limit, let's say it's 10. You can go and execute the step. So I try to execute some of this in K6. From the nature of K6 as of right now, because there is some work in progress being done. But right now, you can do the one when there's a timer. At this moment, OK, all of you guys can keep moving. Again, timer, all of you guys can keep moving. And you'll close the gate for that period of time. Whoever gets uh, back to that step and ready to execute will wait, 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 and you'll give them the pass. It's something that I, I have to say, you don't need that often. But when you need it, now you can do it in K6. That when when I read that, I thought that this is exactly what we did for that betting company that I was talking about, where we were simulating um, one big game day where there were many different smaller races. And each race is like two minutes. So timing is everything because when that race starts, no one can place bets or they shouldn't be able to place bets anymore because it's like you already have information from the race actually beginning. You know, they wouldn't let you bet um, and while you're already seeing the race and who won. So in that case, that would be a very good, um, that would be a very good use case for a rendezvous point because you're waiting to be able to either start or stop some sort of action. In this case, you have to stop betting at a certain point. And then after the race, that's when other things start as well, like checking your bank account and, and refreshing the page to see if you've won. And this is a, a different approach to testing that is very time-based. It's also rooted in reality. No, there, uh, where I kind of used it was in a stock market application where mm. uh, this is this comes from human behavior many traders are waiting 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 until the stock gets to the price that they want or there are even bots that you can program to trigger the buy yeah. stop or the sell process depending on what you're doing because when it gets too high they also like trigger it to sell and from our practical purposes of workload modeling you don't trigger it when it gets to a price. You just want to simulate, you don't care about the price. You just want to simulate that many people are wanting to buy it at the, when that happens, everyone goes bananas and wants to buy it, right? So yeah, there are practical applications for that. And what I just heard is that you're using your load testing know-how to write bots that corner the market. 
Uh, yeah, we can talk about that, but yeah. <laughs> Basic scripts are useful to <laughs> check on stock market prices. I want to know that. <laughs> yeah, or um, get views on YouTube, maybe? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've seen people doing that, pulling that off or voting or, yeah, yeah, you can go very <laughs> questionable with uh, <laughs> script. Yeah, Jose uh, says ticketing uh, as well. Yeah, I, I did one where um, it was this company that, that handles events like concerts and um, sometimes it, it would be like, I, I don't know, a movie screening or like these things that are timed and they go on sale at a specific time. And if you're a super groupie, then you are you will be like they're refreshing the page until a certain point. And that's a good application for rendezvous points too, right? Yeah, no, I, I won't deny. Thank you, Loadrunner. That's how I got to go to Comic-Con, the only time that I was able to. <laughs> And then, oh. yeah, there are some timed applications. That's the only way that you can get that reliably without going to secondary markets. But there yeah. are all sorts of examples that you can go to. It's <laughs> Okay. Well, I think we we're out of time, Leandra, but thank you for coming and, and talking about this. Um, you and I can always talk about the, anything. Can always <laughs> we can keep going <laughs> forever. Yeah, I mean, we can keep going like, so oh long God, I invited you to cold. join. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out with us on a Friday as well. Have a good weekend, I guess. Um, happy testing, and we'll see you next week. Adios, everyone. Bye.